Hello and welcome to today's Institute for Government events. What tools do local areas need to boost regional growth? It's great to have several of you in the room today and a warm welcome to all of you joining online. And I'd like to take this moment to thank international law firm Gowling WLG who are kindly sponsoring the events today. Devolution in England is back on the agenda with Chancellor Jeremy Hunt announcing the creation of new elected mayors in Suffolk, Cornwall and Norfolk in the autumn statement, building on the commitments in the levelling up white paper earlier in the year that every part of England would have the option to get its own devolution deal. At the same time, Greater Manchester and West Midlands combined authorities are negotiating their deeper trailblazer devolution deals. And just today, Gordon Brown's constitutional review has set out a possible future Labour position on the topic as well. All of which makes this a very timely discussion as we take a look at the policy areas where the benefits of devolution or decentralisation may be greatest, at weighing up against some of those benefits of central control as well. Now, before I introduce our speakers, just a few words of housekeeping. This event is on the record and is being live streamed and there'll be a video and sound recording up on our website within 24 hours. Uh, we'll be live tweeting from the uh, Twitter um, at IFG events using the hashtag IFG levelling up. So please do follow along um, and contribute there as well. Um, we're going to have a conversation among the panellists, but there will then be plenty of time for questions. Those online, you can uh, provide them via Slido, so do be thinking of those questions and adding them in um, as soon as the event gets going. And for those in the room, there'll be a roving microphone, so likewise, be thinking of what questions you might like to ask, and please wait for that microphone um, before you speak. And please, uh, when we get to that point, do say who you are and, and where you're from. It's always good to know who we're speaking to. So we have a great panel for this event today. We'll shortly be hearing opening remarks from Robert Breeden, who's a partner and practice group leader for Commercial Employment Pensions and Projects Group at Gowling WLG. Thank you, Robert, for being here. Um, it's great to be partnering with Gowling today. Um, on our screen, we then have um, John Rathmore, who's Director of Strategy, Research and Economy at Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, thanks for joining us. John, and we're also joined by Councillor Bridget Jones, who's Deputy Leader of Birmingham City Council, um, also involved in the combined authority there, and I believe in the um, Gordon Brown Review as well, so it's particularly great to have you here this afternoon, Bridget. And then in the room with me, we have Professor Neil Lee, who's a Professor of Economic Geography at the LSE, um, who can be providing some economic expertise to our conversation today. Um, so I'll now ask Robert to say a few opening remarks from Gowley. <coughs> Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, good morning. As um, Tom says, I'm Robert Breeden. I'm a commercial and projects lawyer with Gowling WLG. And we're delighted to be supporting um, this event uh, this afternoon, indeed a programme of events around levelling up with, with the Institute for Government. Uh, as a firm with a large government sector practice, you'd imagine that we want to be up to speed and to fully understand the issues around any um, flagship government policy but as an employer of a thousand people in the regions, the issue of levelling up is particularly important to us. And so we, we look at the debate around levelling up and we see it's directly relevant. It's directly important to us, both as a firm and our advice as an employer and to our people, but also to our clients. And the issue of levelling up, I don't think has ever been of any greater importance, really. We've seen it over the decades and we've seen a number of different initiatives looking to address it. Um, and we wonder whether actually, again, we wonder whether it's, it's harder now than it's ever been before as we look to tackle levelling up alongside issues such as the rising cost of living, trying to get the economy settled after Brexit and the COVID pandemic, as we look to achieve our objectives around net zero and as we look to secure longer term energy supplies. But perhaps levelling up is part of the solution to some of those challenges. If we are to make a difference, at Gowling, we believe we've all got a role to play. We all need to take part in the debate, whether we're in government, whether we're providing services to government, or whether we're the beneficiaries of those services. And so we're delighted to support uh, this afternoon's debate. I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel in a number of areas. I'll just pick up one or two. One area I'd quite like to hear about is what's the right level of devolution? Where do we push that devolution down. Is it right that it's at a regional and combined authority le level, or can we push it even further? Um, and I'd be particularly interested to hear from the panel as to what are the types of services and functions that are best devolved and those that are best kept centrally managed. And finally, I think, 
if it's right that our local leaders are those who are best placed to understand and address the needs of their places, what are the, what are the changes that we might need around issues such as accountability if we're going to see that Westminster and Whitehall truly let go of that central control? So I'm going to say no more by way of opening remarks, and I hand back to Tom. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Robert. And that's a yeah, wonderful summary of some of the key issues that I hope we'll be covering um, over the next 50 minutes or so. Um, so. So let's get started. And John, I'll start with you. Manchester's long been at the forefront of devol devolution within England, and you're currently negotiating that trailblazer deal. What policies and levers do you think it's most important that combined authorities have hold of if they're going to deliver for their regions? Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom. And Thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, join the discussion today as well. It's uh, extremely well timed, as you said. The um, so uh, back at the back in the summer, uh, the Andy Burnham, our mayor, and uh, Andy Street as well, the uh, the mayor of the West Midlands, sort of set out at an event at the RSA. You know some of their priorities um, that they were looking for through the the devolution deal process, the trailblazers, and I think they've set the direction that we've been working with uh, over the last few months uh, and it's issues that often policy areas that often come up in these sorts of uh, debates I mean particularly around uh, skills adult skills from employment programs uh, transport's a big priority as well um varies a bit for you know from the, the particular policy needs from place to place but from our point of view it's sort of putting together the the bits of the jigsaw on the rail network to go with metrolink and with bus franchising that we're on with at the moment um, and housing, uh, probably the third big policy area for us, um, private rented sector reform, but also um, uh, investment in regeneration in our, our growth locations and renewing some of the housing investment funds that, that uh, we agreed through early devolution deals. But I think the most important area, partly because it underpins everything else, is this question of funding and accountability. I mean, everybody's aware, I think, of how fragmented the funding landscape has got in terms of competitive bids. I mean, just to give you a a, a sense of what that looks like, just with the, at the combined authority in Greater Manchester, we, we we totted up at the end of the last spending review period, uh, and we had 110 different grant agreements with at least 15 different departments or arm's length bodies, and we're investing about a million pounds a year of staff time just to do the audit and financial assurance in that. Um, and that's before you get into issues of um, the sort of the the amount, the, the cost of of putting together those bills, uh, the, those bids, and and um, uh, consultancy across uh, the whole system. Um, so so for us, moving towards that single settlement is the absolute priority. I think also the the great advantage of that is it, it would put devolution on a much more stable foundation, rather than it being program by program. And if that program disappears, devolution disappears, an ongoing settlement for uh, for areas I, we think would be a, a, a much better approach. And, and we were really pleased by the announcement in the, the autumn statement that the the Treasury and government more widely were, uh, were happy to explore with us the, the potential to provide a single departmental style settlement at the SEC spending review. I think that could be um, a really uh, beneficial change. But also linked to that, we're well aware, greater accountability sitting around that. Robert just mentioned it. I'm happy to come back to that. Um, and also having a, uh, a set of agreed outcomes in return for that sort of settlement. But I think if we can reach that a, a deal which embeds that properly, it will be quite a big shift forward for devolution. So I think that's the most important area for us. Brilliant. Thanks very much. John, Bridget, to, to you next. You, much of the focus for devolution at the moment does seem to be about further devolution to combined authorities. You're a deputy leader of a local authority that sits within a combined authority. And um, what, What's your perspective on whether there might be scope for further devolution to local authorities and maybe what belongs better at a slightly higher level of government? Thank you. So I wear two hats in this. So I've got Deputy Leader Portfolio within Birmingham City Council, and then I'm the Cabinet Member for, or the Portfolio Holder rather, for levelling up at the West Midlands Combined Authority, where we're looking at um, negotiating a TDD, same as uh, Greater Manchester. The debate about what goes where, for me, it comes down to what the relevant geography is for that function. 
So LEPs and combined authorities are supposed to represent functioning economic geographies. Councils tend to represent smaller scales that are more aligned with how people lead their daily lives. And it's important to remember combined authority, it's not just a floating entity in itself. It's comprised of the constituent authorities that hold portfolios and have votes on the board on what happens there. They are very much a part of it and not a separate, separate entity. So we're working on our trailblazer devolution deal, same as Greater Manchester. I mean, we've got through, I've lost track of how many ministers and prime ministers since it was first announced. Uh, but we're back with uh, back with Michael Gove now, who is enthusiastic about it, as I understand. Um, not all combined authorities are starting from the same place. So West Midlands has quite different powers to Greater Manchester. We're a much thinner combined authority, uh, far fewer powers. Uh, again, again, it's a different list to what you'll find in London, a different list to what you'll find in, in you know, some of the Yorkshire ones. It's um, every place is a different roster of, of powers at the moment, often due to whatever was in fashion at the time that, um, that they got created and ministerial um, preferences at the time. But with our TDD, we're asking ourselves a question for each thing that we're bidding for. Should it sit wholly with the CA and be administered there with council oversight through the board? Should it sit with the CA for administration, but then be, or accountability rather, but then be delivered through local authorities with a local flavour to it? Or should it be double devolved and wholly devolved down to council? So we're asking that question for each of the things that we are, we're bidding for right now. Uh, we're already in a position where, uh, well, we've got the, the firm principle with our deal, there should be no uh, sucking up of powers from the constituent councils to the CA. We're already one of the most centralised places in the country, or sorry, in the, in the world, in our country. Um, so we shouldn't be taking powers away from local places um, and, and taking them upwards. It should all be about drawing them down. Uh, and as you mentioned, I've been part, um, I'm in Leeds this morning, I'm from Birmingham, but I'm in, I'm in Leeds because um, I've been at the launch of the UK Labour's Commission on the UK's Future, which I've been working on um, as one of the local government representatives for the last year or so. And a key tenant we have applied with this is putting the right powers into the right places. And it's it's for two reasons, really. It's It's the obvious economic one of unlocking the potential that is there being wasted in our cities and regions compared to what we see in performance in other less uh, centralised places. But it's also a democratic one. People have lost faith in democracy. The people uh, turnout in mayoral elections, turnout in local government elections is so, so low. And we are exhausted as local representatives from having to go to people. We know you're so passionate about that, but there's nothing we can do about it locally because the power to do something sits somewhere else. We're all exhausted as councillors with having to do that again and again. Um, there's some really exciting proposals in today's commission that would unlock some of that power, put it somewhere where local people can have influence over it and really feel like their voice matters again. And as well as the economic benefit, hopefully restore some faith in our democracy. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Bridget. Uh, Neil, there are two facts about the UK that are often linked. One that um, Bridget referred to there, that we're one of the most centralised and also that we're one of the most regionally unequal. Um, do you think it's reasonable to link those two as commentators often do? And how do you think the government could design its English devolution settlement in a way that would promote those better economic outcomes outside London and the South East? So is, is uh, our high levels of centralisation, our high levels of inequality, are they linked? Clearly they are. It's a bit more of a sort of complicated link than I think we would often portray. So the, the danger is that we think that we will sort of somehow devolve power to sort of local areas and immediately you will have a sort of uptick in sort of, well, regional equality or, you know, regional growth. And, and the problem is the academic evidence is quite shaky on that. So I think it's, a, I, you know, my personal view is that it's something we should be trying. The academic evidence is more shaky on this than you would expect. And one of the main reasons for this, and this is probably familiar to everyone in this room, is because governments tend to fall on decentralization or devolution as a sort of policy tool when they hit crisis. So you have the, the sort of national state isn't, clearly isn't doing things as well as we might hope. And then because of that, we sort of devolve, you know, power gets devolved. So actually, the sort of conversations we're having now and today are, I think, really, really important in terms of shaping how that sort of devolution happens and how that happens, because that's where the sort of real, that's where the sort of link is going to sort of, or if we sort of manage to break the link between high levels of inequality and high levels of centralization, it's going to be through sort of these sort of very detailed sort of nitty gritty sort of issues. 
The other thing about sort of um, inequality in the UK or regional inequality in the UK is that most of it came out of the 80s and 90s. It's actually been sort of stagnant for some time. And the reason for that is that London's, you know, been doing, ticking over pretty well. And it's very high, regional inequality is very high. But actually there's been nothing despite sort of, in my entire working career basically, nothing has really sort of shifted the dial in terms of regional inequality. So that's kind of problematic. So just to sort of you know, finish up, so I mean, what needs, how we would address, a, how we would sort of make a system which, is, which addresses these high levels of regional inequality, how you decentralize in a constructive way. You need power, obviously. You need money. You need time. You need accountability. I mean, a lot of these things, they're not actually, you know, you don't need an academic to tell you all this sort of stuff. You know, it's not, they're not sort of secret sources. These are things which we all know about. I think there's a more interesting question, which is why, you know, how we can, you know, as Bridget suggested, how we can sort of bring people along with it. Because, you know, when I started my career, you know, I remember Gordon Brown talking about sort of devolving power, and, or Tony Blair, wasn't it? You know, very keen on devolving power. And it sort of died because of electoral reasons. And I think there's a really interesting question about how we can bring people along with it and persuade them that it's in their interests. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Neil. I think, yeah, particularly interesting question there if we talked, Bridget talked about sort of coherent economic geography, but what if that doesn't fit with, say, people's identities as well? And how do we deal with that? What, one thing that came up from all of you was, was the issue of accountability and the fact that you know, if there are further powers and there also need to be further accountability mechanisms. Bridget, I know this is something that the, the Gordon Brown Review does, does mention and think about. What, what do you think would be sort of a good solution on, on the accountability side? So in the centre, we know that an awful lot of people have lost faith in, in politicians. Uh, we've had scandal after scandal, um, you know, second job scandals in particular. Some of the things the Commission recommends are banning MPs from having second jobs and creating really interesting uh, suggestion actually creating a citizens panel which reviews misdemeanors by MPs and makes judgments on those and putting that hand back that power back in the hands of um, of ordinary people which is a really interesting one um, but with the, the with devolving of powers it's a really it's a really key question because the level of accountability our English mayors currently face is very very light compared to what councils face. I'm held to account as deputy leader in Birmingham by my fellow councillors, uh, by scrutiny committees, by the public ultimately. Um, lots of those mechanisms just aren't there to the same extent um, with the mayoralties. But also they're such new institutions, they're so patchy across the UK, that they're very poorly understood by a lot of people. Very few people understand where powers sit at the moment, who they ought to be, who they need to be holding to account for different things and how they can exercise that power. And the point that you raise about that tension between economic geography versus identity is one that we did explore during um, the UK Commission. And we weren't prescriptive on geographies for that reason, um, because it's such a difficult topic to get into and to prescribe anything on. Uh, we've left that very much down to local areas to determine for now what geographies make sense for them for different different things. One man's localism is another man's postcode lottery is the truth of devolution. And resolving that tension between those two things, um, it, it, it's, it's got to be done, uh, but it's a, it's a really interesting one to explore. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. And um, John, there, there are those trade-offs, aren't there, with with devolution of, of power can mean you know, differences in outcomes and differences in provision. You, you mentioned the sets of areas that are priorities for Greater Manchester in their devolution deal. Um, why is it that you think those are the right ones or that the combined authority thinks those are the right ones for, uh, for you to have control over? Yeah, thank, thanks. So I, well, I don't think anyone would claim at the moment there's a quality of outcome uh, in, under the current system. So, so yes, you would be um uh, there will be sort of varying outcomes depending on powers but i think we we've, we've got that anyway the the uh, the trick is to try and uh, improve it everywhere the, but the, the, in terms of sort of settling on those those particular priorities are there sort of slightly slightly different reasons for in different areas i think the um the most important one this uh, the, the a single funding settlement an accountability framework, as I, as I mentioned earlier, because that underpins everything else and underpins devolution as a whole. But on some of the specific policy areas, I think on skills and work, I think there's general agreement that the skill system is very fragmented as it is at the moment, but also there needs to be 
a greater responsiveness of local skill system to be able to respond to local employer needs and sector needs in a more coherent way. So that I think that that sort of sits, sits behind the skills proposals. On employment programmes, which is actually an area where devolution feels though it's gone backwards a bit, certainly in Greater Manchester, the, uh, the a lot of the barriers to employment are you know, to do with health outcomes or, or to do with skills provision or to do with housing as much as sort of some of the, the direct employment issues themselves. And therefore, you know, in the early stages of devolution, we were able to link some of those up in a, a programme called Working Well that was originally run as a pilot and ended up with extremely good outcomes compared to national out, uh, programs and and actually underpinned a lot of the thinking on the work and health program but then we feel it feels like we've gone backwards from there over recent times i think on the on the transport side the reason that one's come out is we've we've got this wider development of, of what's called the B network in Greater Manchester, trying to pull together a coherent public transport system with you know, clearer uh, ticketing, which is um, which can be used across different modes of transport, a, a, a clearer offer to a better, more coherent offer to people using their cars. And they there it's rail is the bit of the jigsaw that's missing at the moment. You know, we have control over Metrolink. You know, that was built and funded un under earlier uh, arrangements. Bus franchising is on the way. How does the rail network fit into that? And I think that on, on housing, I mean, as, as Bridget men mentioned earlier, you know, actually a lot of the, the, the housing agenda is is shaped and delivered at a, a local authority or, or even more local level, um, because that's where the understanding is of local needs and opportunities. But it's again, it's an area where devolution has been successful in Greater Manchester through the housing investment funds, which were agree, uh, agreed, which has um, particularly uh, helped in terms of investment in brownfield sites and uh, an increasing housing numbers but a lot of those arrangements are now coming to an end so there's there's as a renewal point but also the private and you know social uh, rented sectors as well into uh, driving up housing standards that that was a particular priority in the leveling up white paper which was something we agreed with and so our offer to government was you know we're we're up for piloting some of that we're up for um trying to uh, to help you develop uh, what's going to be the most effective policy in those areas so so, it's like, so di different reasons across each of the uh, each of those policy priorities uh, thanks john that's that's really helpful and another thing that that john said earlier was how funding was central to all of this neil do you think that that's borne out in the the evidence or the experience of other countries as well? Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> funding matters, obviously the quantity matters, what you can do, the flexibility matters, and the sort of long-term you know, funding pots matter. So I mean, you know, we were talking about this earlier, it's a terrible, terrible thing to do is to sort of use Switzerland as an example, but I've just come away from doing a load of field work in Switzerland. You know, it's like this sort of different world because you talk to local policymakers in Switzerland and they have ideas about what they're gonna be doing in sort of five, six, 10 years time in a way which would be completely impossible in a country like the United Kingdom. And obviously this is like me comparing myself to, um, you know, Duke Bellingham at football <laughs> or something like that. A, but but there, is, there is something which is, sort of really, which is sort of really important there that actually we don't tend to think. And I would say the other problem we have is that we tend to sort of, we have this sort of system at the moment where we have different regional goals which are conflated in the same set of sort of centralized funding pots. So regional development is one goal which might happen at one particular spatial scale. Then we have other funds which are basically for sort of, you know, revitalizing town centers. This is quite a different sort of policy goal. And they're sort of essentially trying to deliver them through the same sort of spatial government framework. So actually these sort of problems of, of sort of the unclearness of the mission translate into the sort of unclearness of the sort of policy streams. And in the end sort of mean that it's harder to achieve any of our goals. Yeah, great, thanks, thanks very much. That's really interesting. What, one more point that I just want to draw out and, and ask for, for views from each of the panelists, then I'll come to questions. So do the thinking of those in the audience who've already got plenty online as well. And that, that's the issue that, that you brought up, I think, Bridget, which is of capacity. And um, so a couple of different ways, I suppose. What, what, one question is, how far do our local institutions currently have the capacity to take on these extra powers? And um, I'm thinking about that specifically in, in Greater Manchester and, and the West Midlands. But then linked to that, if we think that capacity might be quite different across the country, does that mean that the sort of approach to devolution in England that we've had from this government and previous governments of sort of a patchwork of a deal here or deal there is just inevitably the way that um, this is going to develop or should we be trying to do something more coordinated? So feel free to take that question 
how you like, and I'll go through you all in the same order. So, John. Yeah, I think capacity is a challenge, challenge and something we're thinking about a lot at the moment in relation to the Trailblazer deal. And certainly that that's why for some of the bigger elements of the the proposals, we're looking ahead to the next spending review and what could be agreed through that sort of process. Because you know, if if, if all the proposals that we were putting forward were sort of suddenly dropped on Greater Manchester tomorrow, we wouldn't have the capacity, expertise and skills in place to deliver it, even though we, you know, we're probably in a, a better position than than any other part of the, the of England anyway to to deal with that. So there's got to be a process locally as well of building up, building up that capacity expertise over time. Um, and just on the, you know, does that does that mean we inevitably end up with a, a patchwork? I think it inevitably means that different places are at different stages of that process. I mean, actually, the, the institutional capacity that is there in Greater Manchester is down to sort of thirty years of a institution building and partnership working. So it, it doesn't come quickly, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a patchwork in the sense it has to be random. And I think one of the good things in the Leveling Up White Paper, and a lot of good things in the Leveling Up White Paper, one of them was having a framework for devolution, just giving a sense of direction and giving places a sense of how they move uh, along on that journey towards greater powers and to, to more levels of devolution. So, so not a patchwork, but different places, different uh, different areas on different places in that journey, I think. Okay. Uh, Bridget, see you next. What do you think about capacity and as, an, as an issue? It, it's a real embarrassing issue. So, so if I look at Birmingham City Council, we've lost three quarters of a billion pounds worth of funding since 2010. Uh, we run roughly a three billion pound budget and most of that is locked in spending decisions. It's a huge amount of our of our revenue that has, has gone. And what we've seen in austerity, the way I describe it, the council is like a body that's functioning. It's got limbs that are doing things, running services. But we've lost that sort of central brain function. We've lost, and this is true, the councils up and down the country, the kind of things that have been cut back on, our policy functions, our sort of senior officer capacity. And it really shows in our ability to do things so there's two sides to, to being a local authority. You've got to run a council and run services. Uh, we have run about 1,200 different frontline services that a unitary authority would run. But you've also got to lead a place and you've got to be able to do both of those things. And with the cutting back of senior officer capacity, that ability to lead the place has become has become really difficult. We've sort of retreated into a, a space of just running services. And it's only recently, um, certainly in our council, we've had a bit of headroom to build that back. There's an issue about political capacity, which is very unfashionable to mention, uh, but I'm going to be unfashionable and mention it. So your vast majority of council leaders up and down the country are part time. Your vast majority of council cabinet members are part time. And we've got a situation where the roles and responsibilities of council leaders and council cabinet members have grown and grown and grown over the years to the point where most councils, or certainly most unitaries at least, would need full time cabinet members running them. If I look at Birmingham, we're the size of a small country. You know, my city, there are two EU nation states with smaller populations in my city. We hosted the Commonwealth Games this summer. There are 22 competing nations with smaller populations in my city. You need full time people with capacity to do all of the things politically that the public is expecting you to do. But in, and particularly when engaging with combined authorities, it's a whole extra burden on our time. It's one we embrace willingly because it's a really important one. Um, there's only so many hours in the day that can go around. And where you have in a vast majority of council areas where people aren't being paid to do it full time, councillors don't receive pensions. We don't receive pension contribution. We have no working rights whatsoever. You have an awful of our rights and our best are either priced out from doing it, particularly working age people, disproportionately but not exclusively uh, women are affected by all of this. Um, it's rubbish for everybody, but disproportionately affects women because um, you know time taken out to have kids and so on, affecting pension contributions and over time, over all, all lifetime earnings. Um, we've ended up with a situation where your average councillor is aged 59, and in an awful lot of places, they are being run by people who are part time who don't have the capacity to put this in. It's a very unfashionable conversation to have paying politicians more or changing our terms and conditions, but unless you do that and put some of those protections in, you're not going to have the political capacity to deliver on what the public is expecting us to deliver on and living up to those very high expectations that they have. Um, and you're not going to you're not going to be able to deliver the kind of things that you need to be able to deliver. 
Great, thanks, Bridget. There's I'll wait for the bad headlines to come from that. <laughs> No, that's great, though. There is, in fact, a question saying, would you see increasing the wages of politicians or the government as a possible means to attract top talents into the administration? So you're not the only one who, who worries about these questions, which is great. Neil, to you. So, I mean, I'll be, I'll be quick. I mean, you know you're in trouble if Manchester are looking a bit scared when we talk about capacity, right? As the, the high capacity part of the sort of UK's local government um, sort of system, apart from London, maybe. Um, and look, if we were, you know, if we we're still in the European Union, we'd be talking about capacity building as part of the structural fund as a sort of condition for making sure that that money was sort of spent well and being spent wisely. And for some reason in this country, we, you know, I, I do work with Romanian local authorities and I, you know, I don't think people would ever do sort of similar work in the UK. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong to sort of try and build up capacity to make sure that money is spent wisely and in sort of appropriate ways. So I think there's a sort of problem. And the catch there is that you know, I said at the start that the academic ev evidence on devolution was fairly mixed. It's very clear that if you devolve power at the same time as building capacity, that's when you get the positive impacts. And you don't get that if you devolve power at the same time as having sort of weak local government capacity. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Well, that gives us half an hour for questions. I say lots of questions online already, but I'm keen to go to people in the room first. So please do raise your hands. Um, one man at the back and then the gentleman at the front here. Oh, hello. My name's Andrew, Andrew Edwards, and I wrote a book about travelling Britain and Ireland. I spend a lot of time in Birmingham. I use cross-country trains. I go to Tilton trains at Moore Street or even Avanti West Coast. And I can get to Birmingham for £5.75 if I take West Midlands trains and stop at every station between here and New Street. The reason I mention that is that I was at the Commonwealth Games... I was at the CBI conference. Uh, I was at the Conservative Party conference. I do go to Birmingham an awful lot. And one of the things that, in the national, is that Britain doesn't think it's got tourism. And yet tourism across the country is fantastic. Because you're quite right, Bridget, 55 nations came to Birmingham, and hopefully you're going to capitalise on that by attracting more visitors. But I tend to find that most places don't realise that whether it's a church or whether it's a graveyard or whether it's a monastery, there's great, fantastic tourism. And it's inward investment that people have got to who live in Britain have got to visit Britain so we can understand Britain. And that builds inward investment, it builds confidence, it builds partnerships and everything like that. And from the three of you, apart from Romania and other countries in the European Union where they work better, I've not really heard anything about building and confidence from the UK. Great, thank you very much. And then one question down here. Um, hello, my name is Barry Matthews. I'm a FTSE 100 GC and also the founder of the Social Mobility Business Partnership, which is a charity that facilitates 550 weeks of work experience each year. And we work with um, Manchester, Birmingham, WMC, CMA. Gowlings also fund us as well. Thank you very much for that. My question is um, born out of bitter experience of taking a, a work experience franchise effectively across the UK. So we, get, we basically recruit four different businesses to collaborate and a professional sport, sports club to fill the final day. We then go and look to source students with local authorities who, who then quickly get pushed to LEPS and the Careers and Enterprise Company. And the problem is there's a horribly inconsistent experience for employers and so therefore, the, you know, with, even with our model, where we're taking the heavy lifting away from businesses, and effectively all they have to provide is a day's worth of content and some sandwiches, we still struggle. The most operational draining um, element of our charity is finding students or adults who are in need of this experience. I'm wondering, and this is to um, both John and Bridget, What's the appetite amongst authorities like yourselves, which are far more developed than most, to collaborate in terms of having a common operational framework so there's a consistent experience for charities and or employers in local regions? Great. Thank you very much. That's two questions there. One on um, the importance of um, tourism and inward investment. And it might be interesting to reflect on, on the role of combined authorities and local authorities in promoting uh, their areas. Um, and then also that question about consistent experience. So I'll, I'll, I'll go around the, the panel and feel free to take one or both. Uh, but John, I'll go to you first. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. So on, I'll have a go at both. On, on the first, I mean, I think 
tourism and the wider cultural offer has, has always been a big part of the um, uh, as how Manchester and wider Greater Manchester has looked to regenerate over the last couple of decades. I mean, obviously our, our football clubs are, uh, are well known and bring a, a lot of visitors to the city, but things like the, the Manchester International Festival, the factory as well, the the, the, the new facility that's uh, that's coming next year. The um, the role of the combined authority in that often that's actually about supporting individual uh, local authorities in the offer that they're making, whether by giving it you know additional profile volume, sometimes some of the the, the funding streams, because those um, those uh, cultural offers are often linked to individual parts of the city region. You know, whether it's you know, Bolton or Oldham or Manchester, each has their own uh, you know, different offer and different strengths that they want to promote. So I think for the the CA, it's it's less a role in um, uh, in 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 trying to shape those and more to support what's what's happening locally. But clearly, that is key. Um, I think on the, the second question, inconsistent experience and and um, uh, appetite to collaborate, I mean, that that is always it's always a challenge because there are so many different actors and groups, both locally and, uh, and nationally, who we're trying to um, engage with. I think it's one thing we do reasonably well in Greater Manchester is sort of try and make all those things. I often think that the role of the combined authority is often as a, a convener and a bringer together rather than, you know, often, particularly in areas where formal powers don't exist. Um, and, for, you know, for example, I, I can chair every every three weeks or so a, a economic resilience group which brings together local authorities business organizations other local actors um we do similar things on the the, the vcse sector but it's yeah um, um, it, it, it sounds as though that experience has been very patchy and it, but it's certainly it's hard to draw it together when there are so many different actors on you know across sectors who you're trying to uh, you're trying to pull together into one conversation Great, thanks very much. Bridges, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm glad the gentleman had such a good time in Birmingham. <laughs> um, so tourism's a really good case study um, for devolution. So before the pandemic, one of the things we were advocating for for the Commonwealth Games was bringing in a, a tourism tax. It's very common in just about every other place you go to, certainly around Europe, if not the world, where you'll pay a small city levy, usually about a pound a night on any hotel stays that you make. And that pound a night goes towards funding the kind of things that bring the tourists in, keeping things going. Uh, I've travelled most of Europe, can't think of anywhere I've been that doesn't have it. So we were looking at using that as, a, as an innovative way to fund the games. Uh, and for a pound a night, no one, no one really notices that. Um, the... The, the the uphill battle to get that considered by people, to get that, um, to, to, to work out what kind of legislation that would take to bring that in, to get legislators uh, not just on board, but looking at the different hoops they would have to jump through to allow us to do something like that as a new revenue raising power. It was extraordinary. Uh, we ended up having to drop the proposals because the pandemic happened and um, the last thing the industry needed at that point in time was, was anything like that. It wasn't the right time for it. Um, but we, you know, we bring together the, the frustrating thing for us is you take something like tourism, things that affect it are transport in and out of the area. Do we have pr proper control over that? No, we don't. It's really fragmented and messy. There's promoting the area. Do we have proper control over that? Well, sort of. We um, do some stuff in-house at BCC through our combined authority. We commissioned the West Midlands Growth Company and they did a really good bit of work around the Commonwealth Games in the background of the Games. Whilst everyone was looking at the big shiny thing, we, we brought in businesses and said, OK, we've got your attention with the Games. Come and look at our business and tourism programme. Come and see what we've got to offer in the West Midlands. Come and see what businesses we've got while we've got your attention. And it was um, a really, really good programme running in the background. Do we have control over, um, you know, even things like hotel bed tax? No, we don't. Do we have control over the commissioning of cultural uh, monies which create the institutions and the things that bring in our uh, tourists? No, we don't. Do we, oh, not to a, a, a tiny amounts, but the vast majority we don't. Do we have control over things around the hospitality industry, which again is a massive hook for, for tourists? Or well, sort of, we've got some powers through licensing, some through planning, but not quite all of the ones that we'd need to create something really coherent. 
all of those levers for that affect the massive industry that is tourism, they all fit, sit in different bits of government, different places, or sometimes just don't really exist anywhere at all, and they're totally deregulated. And you know, it's it's this is why I'm, I'm passionate about evolution and just and, and bringing together the right things to unlock to to unlock a, a industry and potential um, in the country. Because if you take that as a case study. There is so much more we could be doing if we had any coherence around all those levers for uh, for improving things. Great, thanks, Neil. Is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, look. So, I, my only thing I'm going to add is that we, because I think there's a danger we're all agreeing with each other too much. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm just going to say, I just I worry a little bit about tourism as an economic development strategy, and the reason for that is because I think it can be really, really important. But I mean, to give you a concrete example, so I live in Oxford, we have loads of tourists and the economic development officers at the city council just say the problem is they don't spend any money. So it's not just about having tourists, it's about having tourists who spend money and stay there and sort of, you know, develop the place in some sort of, you know, important way. So I mean, that's, yeah, that's my one bit of like econ hard reality yeah. to be throw in there at the moment. That's, great. that's what you're here for, Neil. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I'm now going to go to a couple of questions online. These are the top two questions. One is pretty specific and one is quite general. Um, so the very specific one is, can any of the panellists name any specific legislation rather than just more powers that should be delivered at a local level? Imagine if people who've been negotiating trailblazer devolution deals, they've got a head start on that one. Um, and then a more general one, how do we align, align our desires for localism with the fact that when you poll people, they want things nationally? For example, a national app for bin collection. Um, I'll go the opposite way around this time. So, Neil, you can... OK, so the... Um... So I was thinking about the first question, okay. thinking, assuming yeah. I had time. Yeah. So, so the first question, so the, the thing which I think is really interesting is separating out the R&D budget. So as we increase the R&D budget, separating out part of that and giving it to sort of combined authorities in some sense, which would allow them to sort of invest over the long term in the sort of type of stuff which, which sort of, um, which sort of uh, benefits their sort of local firms. The other thing which I just you know, say as well is I'm a little bit cautious about some of this stuff about skills, and that's because we have traditionally had in the UK a system where you know, local, you know, the loudest local business gets a say, and actually sometimes I think a national perspective on some of that stuff in terms of joining it up would be a good thing. And actually reflecting on your comment a moment ago, we used to do this work, I mean, I did some work years ago where we looked at the number of youth unemployment initiatives you had in Shoreditch, and there was 100 in Shoreditch alone. And actually there is some sort of national level pruning and clarification about the system, which I think would be quite useful there. Great. Bridget? Thank you, I'm not mute there. Um, so in terms of specific legislation, um, so my mantra for this combined authorities is transport, transport, transport. That's the biggest area where you could be unlocking things. Um, most CAs have some superficial kind of transport powers at the moment, but not nowhere near what London has. And I think translating the kind of legislation that allows London to operate in the way it is, I realise that's a huge step for most areas. But I'm not like, it's not like I'm asking for something that doesn't exist anywhere. It does exist and it's called London. Literally our country it exists. Translating many of those powers and, um, and, and things down to local level would make such a big difference economically and in terms of people, people's quality of life. So that would be my number one ask. The other would be, um, it's a really simple one actually. It's something I think Neil was saying earlier around budgets. You, know, you talk about uh, places that are planning five years ahead. I don't know what my budget's going to be five months from now. We're currently consulting on a budget for Birmingham City Council. We're going out to consultation the next couple of weeks based on guesswork as to what might happen, based on guesswork around inflation, around the things we do know, but the, the, the wild card being what our settlement from government will be. And we usually only find that out in the run up to Christmas. So we plan a budget based on guessing. We consult on it based on what we've guessed. And then we normally, um, around Christmas and New Year time, find out what our budget is actually going to be, have to retrofit our guesswork and our assumptions onto the actual budget and then pass it in February, ready for go live in the next financial year. And then we begin that whole cycle again. We plan one, it's not even one year to one year. We get so little notice what our budget's going to be. It's mad. Um, council tax decision, but the, the legislation stopping us from doing anything around council tax. We we have a percentage rise we can put on council tax set by government, again through legislation. The um, that locks in decisions taken by people from 12 years ago when councils last had flexibility over how much they could put their council tax up by. 
So a 2% rise at Birmingham raises very significantly less um, because of decisions taken by people 12 years ago than a 2% rise might do in, um, I don't know, uh, in another council somewhere where they took different decisions 12 years ago and had a higher council tax base to start from. Um, all those financial controls over us changing that would really unlock things. Then the second question you asked, so it goes back to what we're looking at with the TDD in Birmingham uh, and no doubt in Greater Manchester as well. So it's, there are three th three ways you can do things. You can have nationally set standards and local and nationally run services. You can have nationally set standards and locally run services. You can have locally set standards and locally run services. And again, it comes back to one man's devolution is another man's postcode lottery. Um, what is right for each service is very much service specific and probably don't have the right mix right now. Uh, we'll probably never have a mix that <laughs> completely pleases everybody. Uh, but the important thing is that you keep reviewing and asking those questions consciously. Great. Thanks very much. John. Yeah, thanks. So, so in the question about legislation, and obviously we're working with colleagues in the department for levelling up about to, to look at the legislative implications of, of what a deal might look like. But it's interesting, often it doesn't come down to legislation or, or not at least to primary legislation. I mean, the, a lot of the areas that I've been describing today are really about where resources sit and who makes decisions over resources. There aren't many things which we can't do in Greater Manchester because we don't have the legal power to do them. There are a lot of things that we can't do because resource decision, because of the way that either resourcing decisions are made elsewhere or the way that funds are structured. Um, so, so now that's not to say that coming out of some of those conversations around single settlements, spending reviews, accountability, there wouldn't then be need to be some legisl legislative changes to embed those. But actually, a lot of them are, you know, these things are not really about uh, legislation. Um, and uh, I mean, just to agree with Bridget about the 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 long the long term planning point. The I mean, as, as she says, the you know, some of the ways that the time periods that funding decisions are made over is just astonishingly short and and prevents planning. One thing we have tried to do is is try to keep some consistency of at least strategic planning in Greater Manchester. I mean, for example, we agreed our local industrial strategy with the government back in 2019 and then obviously national government priorities and everything changed we kept ours because we, we kept we, we our feeling was the evidence base was right we had the buy-in from local stakeholders uh, and therefore we were going to press on with delivering it and interesting interestingly some of the signs from the current government are that they're coming a bit back round to that in uh, that industrial strategy, setting some priority, um, if not sectors, at least functions um, in, a, in a similar way to a local industrial strategy from which sometimes if you stand still long enough, then national government will come back around to where you are anyway. Um, but it does it does give that consistency over time. And on the good, yeah, coming back to the, the question about um, the, the national versus local and, and what people want, I, mean, I think Bridget, covered um, all of the main points. But I think it's absolutely right to say that functions have to sit at the most appropriate level. And, and often within a, a, a policy area, there will be, it, within a single policy area, there will be different parts of that function that, that sit at different areas. I mean, business support is one of my mind at, at the moment because we're, we're working through the Shared Prosperity Fund and, and how that might be allocated. And you know, there are parts of types of business support which better sit at the national level, there are parts which better sit at, on a city region level and there are parts which are better adapted to very local circumstances um, in, in local authorities or, or more um, or even at a, a smaller scale. So it's, some of it is partly about getting those partnerships right with uh, between the different levels but I think almost nobody thinks that that balance is right as it stands at the moment. Brilliant. Thanks very much. We've still got about 10 minutes left. Are there any other questions in the room? Yes. Gemma over here. And then this gentleman over here. Hello, Gemma Tetlow from the Institute for Government. Um, I just want to almost flip the question around. I'd be interested in panellists' views on what do you think central government should be focusing its efforts on? In your ideal future world, what are the things that central government could most usefully be doing to facilitate you doing what you want to do? Thank you. And then this gentleman over here. Um, Robert Morland. I'm a former member of the European Parliament and of the Economic and Social Committee of, of the EU. And I was actually chairman of its regional committee. 
and of course dealing with a totally different position than we have now because it was very regional and very geared only to the um, high unemployment, low income areas. But the other side of me is I am totally different from our speakers because I come from Gloucestershire and I think the whole view is different in the sense that it's very much more micro than regional. Indeed, you may recall that in, under the Labour government when they had the referendums which fell the first post, but always at the bottom and the least likely to vote for a regional government was the South West. Um, and therefore, I was actually at a meeting in Gloucester on levelling up on Friday, and I was very conscious of the micro rather than the maxi, you might say. Um, and all councillors were giving their... what They were telling me about the forms they had to fill in, the projects, and what should they put. I got asked a lot of advice, which I did helpfully, um, particularly with the help that they bought all my drinks. But um, so it's a different scene there. And I'm really asking the question, when we talk about tools, do we need to concentrate on tools for councillors as much as anyone else? And also, is there a danger that we get too micro? Great, thank you very much. So one question from Gemma on what are the tools that central government should be using to, to deliver um, well? And even in a more devolved settlement, what, what would central government still be doing and what would its role be? And then a question about sort of what's the right level to be thinking about these tools and, and, and where should we be going? Um, John, I'll go to you first. Thanks, yes. So on the, yeah, the focus for central, I mean, clearly there are, there are functions and a lot of functions which are best held at a, a national level and, and delivered at a, a, a national level. Um, you know, the, the NHS being one, the, um, the uh, economic providing some macroeconomic stability might be another uh, and the um uh, and defense as well the but, but e even when we're talking about some of those national functions I mean, something like the nhs i, mean, I don't I think every, everybody's um largely agreed that there should be the national standards and national provision there but then there's there's even in that case there's a case of well how do you then integrate it with care happening at a local level and some of what we're seeing at the moment about how that that breaks down if the, the the partnership working the links between the national and the local don't uh, operate well so um so yeah what should central government be focusing on that bigger strategic picture and stability that allows the local decisions to then be made within that as well as some of those national functions and on the, the question about the um the the micro level the and, and tools for councillors it, it comes a bit back to the the sort of discussion that um we were having earlier about uh, capacity uh, and and ability of local politicians and local decision makers and and, and bridget you know saying um should potentially being controversial but you, you see some of that in the scrutiny and accountability debate in greater manchester as well that you know indiv in for these models to work individual councillors need the ability to be able to the, the knowledge and the background and the ability to be able to scrutinize to challenge decisions locally but also then to take decisions locally and be able to engage with um with whether it's regional uh Government, regional bodies like combined authorities and national government. So uh, for me, that that micro, the key thing about the micro level is making sure that the the knowledge and the capacity is there to be able to do that. Take take those very local decisions and take them well when they need to be, but also to be able to scrutinise and hold to account locally what's happening at a a local authority or a combined authority level. Great. Thanks very much, John. Bridget. Thank you. Um, so what can central government most usefully do? Um, stand still, stop changing every five minutes right now would be my number one thing. <laughs> Give us a coherent set of ministers to engage with um, on, on things that we need to engage with. Uh, or hopefully things are settled down for a little bit. Um, Give us longer term planning horizons would be a massive, massive bonus and stop the micro bidding. So many of the pots of money we have to bid for are micro things based on what ministers like this week. 
uh, rather than what we locally need. It's turning things on its head, actually, to, in the same way you have with the question. So rather than government saying, we want this, here are some tiny pots of money to go away and deliver it, but it's turning it on its head and what would be most useful is government going, what do you need to achieve locally and how can we help you achieve it using the different powers that we have? Government is there to legislate. We're largely here to deliver uh, things in our local areas. So I turn it on its head and say government needs to say to us, what what do we need rather than telling us what we need? And then the question about um, the micro and sport councillors. So question about why you know why did people vote against the southwest or why were why was it speculated people would vote against the southwest assembly or why have people voted against them in other places you know, is it fear of a loss of power from their local place sucking up to a regional thing is it a lack of shared identity with the places around them is it uh, is it a straightforward hatred of politicians and i use the word hatred because that that's definitely how it feels um when when you're on the receiving end of it there is just a, a general hatred in this country uh, and probably others around the globe to anyone who is remotely uh, involved in, in being elected that's got worse and worse over the last few years and the fear that there might be more politicians running things um there's that disconnect between the micro and the macro so you know the vast majority of local residents in my inbox are complaining about trees and potholes <laughs> They're not grilling me on on what what instruments do I want to be devolved to the West Midlands Combined Authority in a trailblazer de devolution deal. Um, it, it, it's it's the hyper local that people can um, come to you on the hyper local that they vote for you on. Um, you know, just give you an example of how hard it is to plan at a, even a, even a moderately macro level. It's a truth universally acknowledged by councillors that everyone believes a stretch of road outside their house must be 20 miles an hour, but very few people believe anywhere else should be. Trying to plan on a greater level than, than the absolute micro is really, really hard uh, when it comes to comes to the ballot box. And part of that is simply, you know, education of the public and just being clear about what it is that we're here to do. Um, but it come back to what I said earlier, you've got to be able to do both. You've got to be able to run a council and also lead a place. And that place you're leading has got to also be be your ward and your city. Um, but uh, just one final point, because I realise I'm going on on capacity. So there's a, I don't believe on this on other councils, so I'm not going to name it. There was a council in the north that has had some difficulties recently where councillors, uh, cabinet members were criticised for not properly scrutinising cabinet reports. Some disastrous decisions were taken um, and uh, the council's gone sort of bankrupt. The um, When you look at what those cabinet members were earning, it was just over, it was around about 25k with no pension. Very few people who have the professional background and skills to be able to scrutinise multi-million pound budgets, often multi-billion pound budgets, um, and um, and put in 50 hour weeks to do what is required of you are going to give up a lucrative career to go and be a cabinet member in an authority like that with that level of personal jeopardy for 25k with no pension. Very few people are going to do that. And that's a very common position up and down the country. And again, very unfashionable to raise it. But unless you address some of that question, you're not going to address some of the issues I've just talked about uh, in terms of people's expectation of politicians not matching what they're able to deliver. Brilliant. Thanks. Anything to add on that, Neil? So to be quick, I mean, so I think the Gloucestershire, so, you know, you say you're from Gloucestershire and that makes you sort of different. I'm from Oxfordshire. You know, probably the thing we have in common is that at least we're not from Wiltshire. <laughs> they're sort of... Um, <laughs> But, but I, think it, I think the Gloucestershire issue is a really interesting one, and actually I think it, it goes back to Gemma's question as well, which is that central government, there, there are some hard choices which need to be made about sort of spatial development. You know, we know the economy is favouring cities and sort of more accessible areas. Central government does have a role to play in saying, actually, you know, not everywhere can be a sort of global innovation hub. You can have your sort of, you know, you can put some sort of, you know, top investment in sort of, Birmingham, Manchester, and then maybe it's a different type of, of sort of economic development strategy for somewhere like sort of Gloucestershire would be my sort of my suggestion. Um, yeah. Brilliant. OK, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to ask one more question and ask for very brief answers from the panel. Um, now, one question here is an anonymous question saying, is the conclusion to all of this that Professor Philip McCann was right? I'm assuming that wasn't an anonymous question written by Philip McCann. <laughs> yeah. But I know that he was one of the um, people working on the Gordon Brown Commission, as was uh, Bridget. So I wonder if you could give your, your brief 30 seconds, if you can, on, on what, what you think about that commission and, and where it's going next. Appreciate that's a, a broad question, but it is the topic of the day. So I'll go in the, the same order. John, if you can go first. 
I, to be honest, not had a chance to uh, to read through the report from today, but just from skimming it, I think it, it's it's very encouraging that there seems to be a cross party consensus in terms of the direction of travel here. And I think from a from a devolution and a trailblazer point of view, and embedding that for the long term, I think that's really encouraging. Right. Bridget. A slightly biased point of view, given I sat next to him at the launch about two hours ago. Um, I, I, I think the commission's really exciting. It's 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 a really radical set of things. I um, did five fringes at the Labour Party conference and another five at the Conservative Party conference uh, because it was in Birmingham. Uh, so so I was invited along to them, all about like devolution and levelling up. And I was really struck by across party lines, everybody was on the same page about this stuff, except ministers at the time. Now, on a new prime minister and a new government since then, the ministers have changed um, since then and, and uh, again, are more enthusiastic about this agenda. But it really struck me that across party lines, actually, people were, were saying um, similar things. It was just the, the people at the very top at that point in time that that weren't on board with it. But do read the report. I think it's a really exciting report, some really, really great principles in there. Uh, have a look. Great, and final word to you, Neil. So I'm gonna plug Philip McCann's book, which is excellent, and published at the Regional <laughs> Studies Association book series. You should all read that. It gives you a hint of like where his sort of thinking's come from. And I will say the sort of the problem here, right, which is that, you know, we say, we are all agreed. I think there is sort of general sort of agreement of at least the sort of direction of travel, and a new administration's gonna come in at some point soon, and they're gonna be hit by a load of other big problems. And the question is, how can we build this as a sort of long-term journey in the UK's political economy, rather than being just a sort of period when we all agree on things and then just forget about it as soon as the next big global event happens. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. A reminder that the event live stream will be available online on our website and on YouTube uh, within the next couple of days. I'd like to thank the audience in the room. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for coming along. Um, do stick around for refreshments. And thank you to everyone joining online as well. Special thanks to my panel, to John, to Bridget, um, and to Neil. And thank you to, to Robert and to Galing for sponsoring the events as well. Um, so if you found this interesting, you'd like to attend our next event on how can the government strengthen the UK's resilience, that's on Thursday the 15th at 3pm and you can register now on our website. Um, and as we close, would you please just join me in thanking all of our panellists. <laughs>